from the UK where you are, Shania. So uh, mm -hmm. it's time to welcome everyone for this uh, the, our 12th webinar today with Dr. Shania Lee. I'm Laboratories and DNA Life, a group of companies that are dedicated to change healthcare through functional medicine and personalized medicine. So we use uh, terminologies like health optimization, longevity, promotion of healthy physiology, anti-aging, functional medicine, personal lifestyle, everything in one bundle. And of course, to support you practitioners, we have the online uh, version of, of our offerings where you can get uh, lab tests and supplements, also some of the things that Shania will be talking about today. And as usual, it's recording if Zoom and the internet will help us on that and we will <laughs> share as soon as we can. So today it's uh, the amazing Shania Lee that we have with us. And Shania, she's a doctor in homeopathy. She's from South Africa and she's living in England. And when she banged on our door, uh, we of course welcomed her with open arms uh, to become a member of the Nordic DNA Life um, family. So, and that has absolutely not been a regret because Shania, she's just an unstoppable woman, woman, no bullet literally stops her. And she just loves functional medicine and she practices um, with patients of course on her own and some of you already know her because she is your practitioner support person at Nordic and some of you have already followed her education and Shania has actually promised me a little bit that some education a program that she's going to offer some in the autumn and of course we will send out the invites for this. Otherwise, I'm just going to say that uh, we're going to have a little break from the webinars. I hope the next one will be the 13th of August. And that's basically because I'm going to go camping um, for a little while on and off. <laughs> and then when I've been camping, I'll come back. Um, but that's my summer treat with my friends um, where we are just out in nature and we weather in Europe is not that great. So of course we hope for better. I'll send you pictures. Um, but anyway, remember that the, the purpose of these webinars is really to create a family friendly community where you as practitioners can write you separately and but apart as I sometimes say. So, and just to get Nordic and DNA Life, get to us, know, get you to know Nordic and DNA Life much better. So, but enough from me, um, Shania, you will get the stage now and we are looking so much forward to hearing about you and how you master mold and mycotoxins and so on in your practice. So here you go. Ah, well, I think it's funny that you say bullets don't stop me because something called mold and mycotoxicity very nearly stopped me dead, <laughs> um, which is, you know, there's no university like, uh, like getting sick yourself. So um, having gone through my whole education, been in practice for many years, I still wasn't really clued up on on the difference between mold, allergies, mycotoxins, what do they all do? How do they affect you? Um, until I got infected myself. Um, and it's been a bit of a journey since then. Uh, some of you might notice that in, in the, uh, Europe or England, we spell mold with a U. This is not the case in these slide decks because our providers are American. And so we're going to respect the American spelling for, for this particular presentation. In most cases, <laughs> I still spell estrogen with an, with an O. <laughs> um, another thing is if you've never experienced a teaching session with me, uh, it tends to be quite jam-packed. There are a lot of slides. There are 153 slides. Uh, a lot of them are reference. So don't be alarmed if I say to you, this is just a reference slide and I skip right over it. The reason being is I'd rather you know they're there. And when you print them out, my vision is that you're gonna print this out, hopefully bind it, and then actually use it as a reference when you do the tests. Because I've, I've numbered the pages and, and try to make it so that these slides sort of are your backup when you're doing the test that we talk about in this, in this session. So please do that, it would really be nice for me. Okay. <clears throat> These beautiful pictures here are fairly extreme. Uh, you, know, you don't necessarily have to see mold for it to be affecting you. That's the number one thing. So if your car doesn't look like this, or your fruit doesn't look like this, or your walls don't look like this, it doesn't mean that you're not being affected. 
Uh, mold is generally visible, mycotoxins are not. Uh, so you can be affected without even knowing it. Um, generally, we're affected from our, our environments. Um, the average person in the modern westernized world spends about 80 to 90% of their time indoors. So that could be home, work, or school if it's a school going person. Uh, so home environment and work and car environment are some of the main places where you actually get your exposure. Foods are more of a compounding issue. It's not like you'll get like the, the biggest exposure from foods, but they will be a mediator. So when I talk about the, the diet at the end, um, there are certain foods that attract certain molds and mycotoxins. So there's no one size fits all program at the end, unfortunately, everyone's different. And also you can tailor make your plans around if this person has uh, xeranolone as a mycotoxin, they might not be able to eat asparagus for a while but I'll go through this and hopefully you'll understand what I'm saying at the end. First, I'm gonna differentiate the difference between a mold allergy, a mold toxicity, and then also colonization, because people don't seem to understand that there are actually different ways that mold is gonna affect you. So toxic molds are a bit misleading. We're generally made toxic by the secondary metabolites. So that's the vapors that they produce or the mycotoxins. Allergies are when you get exposed to the spores or the molds themselves, you get contact with the mold and you have an allergic reaction to it. That's an immunological thing. Um, if you're immune compromised, you might have colonizations. Those can be pretty severe. So I'll talk a bit more about that. So essentially they're allergies, infections and colonizations by mold or these volatile compounds and mycotoxins as the toxic byproducts. You'll notice at the bottom of a lot of my slides, I've got clickable links. Uh, this, I like to reference every slide if possible, if not give you some points of where to dig deeper because although there are 153 slides, I could literally talk forever about mold. So being told to only talk for an hour is a challenge. Um, mold. So now we're talking about mold, not the byproducts. Here we have allergies and infections and colonizations. The allergy is when you have a reaction with that produces an immunoglobulin like IgA, IgE, IgG. Okay, it's characterized by all the irritating things that make you rub your nose, cough, sneeze 50 million times, itchy, swelling, redness. I've just described what I was like in about 2015 because uh, <laughs> I was all itchy, swollen and red, <laughs> as well as the, the inflamed and, and pain that came with the, the rest of it, but more on that later. Um, colonizations tend to only affect people who are immune compromised. Um, they can be systemic, they can be deadly, not just dangerous. People die from them. And I do have a, a link to an article about that later. So when you're thinking mold, not mycotoxins or volatile organic compounds. The tests that you want to think of are the blood test for the immunological response, because that one will tell you which mold you've been exposed to. It's not going to tell you which mycotoxin you've got in you. The mycotox does that, okay? And the organic acids is like an add-on, and I'll show you what you look for in an organic acid test. These are produced by molds that have taken up residence in your body and they're literally producing their own byproducts, their own organic acids. So microbial volatile organic compounds. This is when you walk into a room and it smells like an old wet dog, but you don't have an old wet dog, okay? It's, it's that typical damp locker room old cheese smell. Um, and it, most people don't even think that they're toxic, but the MVOCs produce ethanol, terpenes, and benzoyl cyanides, along with a whole host of others. And they've got a bunch of slightly irritating symptoms, uh, discomfort, headaches, dizziness, the irritations, but asthma, which can be severe, and Parkinson's disease. And I've given that specific link so that you can have a look, um, that these volatile compounds, not the mycotoxins, not the mold, can actually be linked to something as degenerative as Parkinson's. So mycotoxins is what we think of when we think of mold sickness. Uh, so is uh, the chronic inflammatory response syndrome. And this is basically where every system in the body is now being affected. The mitochondria, the, the endocrine system, the nervous system, every single system in the body is literally attacked by these mycotoxins. 
So mycotoxins are actually uh, substances produced by mold as their defense mechanism. So if, you're, if you see mold on a wall and you start to clean it, um, it's going to fight back. Or if you have mold in your system and you start to kill it off, chances are it'll produce some mycotoxins as it dies off because it doesn't want to die. Um, the other reason that they produce mycotoxins is they, they prepare the substrate that they're on for food because they're basically eating whatever they're sitting on. Uh, they're, they're everywhere um, and there's no upper safe limit for them. Uh, some of them are so toxic that they're used in chemical warfare. And like I said, they affect every single system in the body. I'll talk a little bit about the end of what we can do to, to sort of not kill off mycotoxins because you can't really kill them, they're not alive but to how you can manage mycotoxins. Thankfully, they, their toxicity does reduce over time. Another thing about people with mold illness is they do not detox well. And um, mycotoxins are lipophilic. So they, they go into your body and you, they get stored there. They can also cross the blood-brain barrier and placenta. They've even been found in breast milk. So they get everywhere in you, around you, and, and if they're not bound to uh, binders, and we'll talk about binders specifically, they're reabsorbed into the enterohepatic circulation and they basically just redo all that horrible damage to the, the liver that they've already done once before. Um, another thing about them is they are fantastic mimickers of every other disease. So if you're treating someone for something like Lyme's disease or even just chronic fatigue syndrome, and you're running all the labs and the labs don't look exactly like they should, but you know you're on the right track and the treatments definitely aren't working. There's often this concomitant mycotoxin or mold illness. And if you rule that out, if you fix that first, everything else is easier to fix. So I'm not saying it's there every single time, but it's there a lot of the time. So this is a case where a family, including the dog, we're all exposed to mold. Now, unfortunately, dogs and animals get the short end of the stick when it comes to mycotoxins, because if a batch of grains is tested and they find mycotoxins in the grains, what they do is they put it into animal feed, like they'll give it to dogs and cats rather. So try and feed your animals grain-free foods if possible. Um, they, they did um, tests on all of these these so breast milk, placenta, umbilical cord, the baby's, the newborn baby's urine, and then the, the dog had developed all these masses and lipomas. And there are toxins found, the trichothecenes are so toxic, and uh, these are the ones used in chemical warfare. Aflatoxins are DNA damaging and cause cancer. Ocrotoxin, I mean, all, all of them, terrible toxins to have in your system. Do you'll notice that the only place that they weren't is this newborn baby's urine. But this is because they had already moved out of their environment. This, new, this newborn baby still had allergies, though. So probably got exposed uh, in utero, had all of the, the nastiness happen, doesn't have the mycotoxins in them at that moment, but is, is allergic gets everywhere. So the symptoms of biotoxin illnesses occur in clusters. So start to, this is a great little handout to, re, to refer to. And they don't always stick in those clusters. So don't, don't think of this as a regimented, if it's not like this, it's not mycotoxins or it's not mold. Uh, think of it when you're looking at something viral, bacterial, maybe even flu, but it's, there, there's something odd about it. Like in this case, it could be nosebleeds or something like vertigo, ice pick pain. Um, the symptoms are so random and varied that it's, it's often, often overlooked. So what I did was I created this, what I call a checklist, because you can literally start ticking off how many symptoms your client has or your patient has. I don't even think I put everything on there, um, but I want to focus on like why why does brain fog and this these neurological issues happen so mold toxic brains they produce excessive amounts of glutamate and pea which is palmito something <laughs> both of those things are really electrifying brain chemicals um, they're also anti-aging when they're at their normal levels but excessive amounts unfortunately are 
over electrical and you can get insomnia strangely enough they, they also cause hair loss and, and obviously with the, the electrifying stuff they'll definitely cause anxiety um, there's often this a uh, period of time where people start to get, they get sick, but they get worse and worse and worse and worse over time. There's a progression of the illness. So they'll notice that their anxiety now is worse than it was, say, a few months ago. And this is because they're accumulating these toxins. They get stored in the nervous tissue. Um, and then inflammation happens with mole toxicity because there's this continual release of pro-inflammatory cytokines. I'll try to get into why that happens in the next couple of slides. Um, also, mycotoxins are potent endocrine disruptors to the point where they can cause miscarriages. Uh, they can affect both estrogen, the thyroid, and other hormones like leptin. So they bind to leptin receptor sites so that leptin can't do its job of, of regulating hunger and energy. Um, and what it also doesn't do once it's got that, once it's bound to that site is that leptin can no longer stimulate the production of alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone, which is MSH. And that has a knock-on effect of causing a reduction in melatonin, uh, which can also cause sleep problems. Uh, melatonin is also the favored antioxidant for mycotoxicity. So you'll notice melatonin goes down as mycotoxicity goes up. Uh, so that's why I mentioned Dutch in a couple of the things as well, because it's a good way to test what's going on with melatonin and glutathione. Um, another thing is antidiuretic hormone can be blocked. So there's this excess thirst and urination. I mean, people who are mold mycotoxic with the, when it's affecting ADH, it'll affect their quality of life because they won't be able to take uh, an extended train ride without needing to know exactly where all the toilets are en route because uh, it can be that bad. So this is one of the theories behind why mycotoxins have such a major effect on the mitochondria. It's the cell danger response. Um, I've given the link here for chronic illness, uh, excellent site for you to go and have a look at, but I'm gonna try and describe it a little bit in this slide. Here we have a healthy cell, a cell with a mitochondria which has intracellular ATP. Now, intracellular ATP is energy. Here we have mold, or pretty much any kind of stressor, and the mitochondria leaks out its ATP to the point where it becomes extracellular. Now, extracellular ATP is a damage-associated molecular pattern. So these are now damps. They then bind to cells which create these inflammasomes, okay, and they just stay on until there's no longer a stressor. So that's the cell danger response. The ATP going from being intracellular to extracellular, activating this inflammation. Basically, mitochondria coordinate our cellular defense mechanisms against the mold cellular defense mechanism. But there's more. So trichothecene is one of the worst mycotoxins. It's, when we're testing it, it's not just one, it's a family of them. So in the mycotoxins, there's a few of them. And they affect mitochondrial gene expression, which is central for cellular homeostasis. So this process is 100% impeded as a primary target, not even as a secondary disruption. It is the primary target of that particular mycotoxin. It's literally attacking the DNA of the mitochondria. Mitochondria or mycotoxins also affect the microbiome. We know from penicillin that some my, my, uh, molds can be antibiotic. That's a good one in some cases, but it's not so great when you've got all these random antibiotics in your gut killing off all your good bacteria. Okay, so they're not antibiotics in the way we know penicillin to be. They're antibiotic to your microbiome. Um, so if you have a case where you see really bad dysbiosis, there's lots of intestinal permeability, there's mal malnutrition in some cases, lots of gut inflammation, possibly even diarrhea, and definitely an increased uh, susceptibility to infections, including parasites. So a lot of people who just can't get rid of their parasites might have mold. I say might, because again, it's not always the case, but it is very often. So they get into the body, uh, 
one of three ways essentially you can eat them you can have them touch your skin or go through your eye or you can inhale them so you can eat them either by direct or indirect contact so direct contact is you've got a bowl of fruit and one of them is moldy and you eat the one next to it still got mold in it that's a direct contact a, an indirect one is where grain was moldy it got killed off but the mycotoxins do not get removed during the processing so they're still there in the final product um, this is common in cereals so be aware of the fact that mycotoxins are extremely difficult to get rid of uh, they're in the air they're really tiny um, so easy to breathe in through the nose and the mouth they enter through the skin uh, through the eyes and the skin but the skin is the least uh, effective way for them to enter your body they really have to have proper contact uh, with your clothes or uh, your linen I'll skip over this because those are common but I like people to be a little bit more refined in their choice so how do you test I've added here not just the test that Nordic offers but in, when it comes to mold and mycotoxicity, you can't just test the person. You have to look at the home environment. So dust, dust sampling is the, the preferred method. You can also get these little Petri dishes of Amazon where they, they kind of eventually look like this, uh, where you buy them, you leave them in the rooms, you then send them off to the lab and they say uh, X, Y, Z has grown in the Petri dishes. There is this uh, environmental relative moldiness index that you can do. Um, it is expensive, mold inspectors are as well. But if you're extremely ill in your environment, you wanna get the ERMI index, which is this down here. You wanna get that to two or less in their reports. Um, the mycotox, this is an example of it here. Uh, it measures 11 toxins from about 40 different mold species and it uses mass spec so it's sensitive and specific to the mass of the mycotoxins. Um, it measures toxic load. Um, it's complemented by the OAT test. Oh, my nose is dry. Oh. And both are offered by Nordic. So which is the best test is what everybody asks. Well, it really depends on the symptoms of the person presenting. In an ideal world, you'd actually do them all like the mycotox oats and expanded mold panel because they look at different parts of the, the infection. Um, but if somebody predominantly has allergy symptoms and they only want to do one test, start with the expanded mold panel and then potentially do one of the other ones later if you need to. Um, I'm going to mention these tests in a moment because they're related to a specific protocol. Um, and then don't forget that there are things like Dutch, uh, the stool tests and a new test called Metabolomics Plus, which you can use over and above because some of the mycotoxins are extremely estrogenic. Um, I've already mentioned that they affect melatonin and they definitely affect glutathione. So if somebody is coming in and they've got all these estrogenic symptoms and you're suspecting that it's a mycotoxin, by all means run a, run a concurrent test of Dutch so that you can have an idea. Stool would pick up if there's any candida uh, or dysbiosis. Um, and the metabolomics is kind of like the, the Nutrival non-invasive. Uh, so it's blood spots and uh, urine, so as opposed to a blood draw. And it looks at all the mitochondrial markers as well as toxins, uh, fatty acids, amino acids. Really nice overall test. So the mycotox, this is an example. This particular mycotoxin here is extremely estrogenic. If you see it, uh, you need to clean it out of, especially a woman, but it, it will affect men as well. It does affect men slightly differently. Um, there are a couple of schools of thought when it comes to should you or shouldn't you do things before you run the test. So Dr. Shaw of Great Plains, he does not really like people doing uh, glutathione before testing, but Dr. Nathan, uh, whose book I've got at the end, it's called Toxic, uh, he recommends doing what's called a mycotoxin challenge, which is 500 milligrams of glutathione twice a day for seven days, and you collect the urine on the seventh day. He also says that you should probably do a hot bath or sauna the night before, and stop all binders at least three days before the testing. 
However, you have to be extremely careful with this particular protocol if you are wanting to do it, because there are some people where if you give them just one glutathione, they react terribly and you just can't do the protocol. So uh, it might be driven by their reaction rather than anything else. If somebody does react, obviously stop and uh, collect as soon as possible after that reaction. So a lot of people think that mycotoxin urine testing isn't valid because we're exposed to them all the time, which is true. And so Great Plains Labs did a test recently, um, 82 controls, 103 moldy patients, and 51% of the controls did have ochratoxin, uh, but they averaged at 1.6 nanograms per gram, which is not a lot. And the moldy patients were above 18 and it was present in 85%. So definitely there is, there is exposure on a day-to-day -day basis, um, but it's when it's building up or it's more, uh, it's more of a, an impact, uh, then yeah, definitely urine mycotoxin uh, testing is valid. Any positive result is significant. The reason for this is that uh, in people who are mycotoxic, or the sick with mycotoxins, they, they don't detox well necessarily. And also it's, it's, bound up in your body, it's in your fat, it's in your nervous system. So often if you, if you take the test and you look at the person, you can kind of go, well, th this is probably just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, and don't be alarmed if the numbers go up in a retest. That could happen for a couple of reasons and you really have to take one, each one into context. You have to ask the person, you know, have you been in an area where you could have been re-exposed? It could be that detoxification has improved, in which case they'll probably be feeling better or in some cases, there's excessive binding, which kills off the mold a little too quickly. They won't be feeling well in that case. Um, and they'll be released, the mold is releasing toxins as part of its defense mechanism. In that case, you have to reduce the, the dose or stop the binders and then reintroduce at a much lower dose. Um, everybody's different and everybody reacts at a, a different dosage. So you've got to be quite careful with that. Here is the organic acid test or the oat test. And if we're thinking of aspergillus, we're looking at these three markers here. So it's two, four, and five. Um, we can pick up candida, we can pick up mold in general. And not related to yeast and fungal markers, but still significant is oxalate, which is often elevated uh, in aspergillus. Here is our interpretive guide. So you can see Aspergillus, Aspergillus, Candida, uh, associated with infection with a number of molds, actually, the oxalic acid. So do use the guide along with the test. And then the mold allergy test. I just want to put it out there that these are my results from December, this, this December 2019. So let me interpret this for you. Here we have IgE, so I'm allergic to epicosin. If I come into contact with this, I do have a reaction. This is IgA. So these are the ones I was being exposed to at that point in time. Okay, IgA, current exposure. IgG, these are all the ones <laughs> that I've been exposed in the past. So there's not a mold I've never experienced. <laughs> and the thing about IgG is people seem to think that oh, no, IgG is a, it's a delayed reaction. It's not nearly as bad as IgE. But unfortunately, the, the ones that are three and four can be as severe and, and pretty nasty. So I have to be super careful with my environment these days. So I brought up these three tests. Um, if you are interested in mold and mycotoxicity, you probably know about the Shoemaker Protocol. Uh, so I did some, I did a lot of homework for this, and I listened to many different uh, versions of whether that people should or shouldn't follow protocols in general, but this one in particular. And uh, both Dr. Shaw and Dr. Nathan uh, say that this this test, although it's it's excellent when you know the Schumacher protocol. It doesn't actually tell you anything other than there's a non-specific inflammatory reaction happening here. And it could be that there's Lyme disease interfering with the interpretation of the results as well. So um, 
you know, if you, if you know the test well, I would recommend it. But I would say that if you're getting into mold and mycotoxins, don't, don't be bogged down by the fact that there is a protocol out there that people follow because there are protocols that aren't that protocol <laughs> that do still work. Um, Marcons, this is a bacteria that is uh, antibiotic resistant that tends to populate the nose in people who have uh, biotoxin sickness. And again, if you listen to uh, doctors who treat a lot of moldy patients, um, whether this test adds value to their treatment may or may not be the case. Uh, often people will just treat the, the nasopharynx uh, area regardless. And then when it comes to HLA sensitivity, you could be HLA positive and sure you, you would be sensitive, but there are many people who are HLA negative and are very sensitive. So it's kind of like maybe you are, maybe you aren't, maybe it increases your sensitivity. Um, it doesn't stop you from being sensitive if you have an exposure though. Uh, so in my opinion and the way I work with people is I would rather understand how does their body detoxify or how, how does it work with inflammation or oxidative stress because then I can work more on their healing and less on doing multiple tests and finding out more about them. So I think rather than spending their money on testing, I'd rather spend their money on them getting better. This is the Schumacher biotoxin pathway. I'm not going to go into it. You're welcome to uh, do your own homework on that. This is available online at around $15. It's a visual contrast test. Uh, the more moldy you are, the more you are at this end of the spectrum. So if you've got good visual contrast here versus here, um, this is a pass, this is a fail. However, there are other things that, that it could also cause a failure and that's mercury toxicity and Lyme disease. So just bear that in mind. If you do a visual contrast test, it's not, it's indicative. Okay, so I wanted to go into some of the conditions and I just want to stress it's only some of the conditions because I would be here for a week if I went into all of them. And I wanted to go into some of the main ones that we see as practitioners specifically uh, and are more common these days. And this one was a no brainer, chronic fatigue syndrome. I mean, it's it's huge as an illness and it's extremely debilitating on the economy and on that person's life. Um, and like it says in the first line there, over the past 20 years, exposure to mycotoxin producing mold has been recognized as a significant health risk. In this case, 112 people with a prior diagnosis, 93% of them tested positive for at least one mycotoxin. So um, they're, there is that link between mycotoxins, the mitochondria, and hopefully I've given you some kind of insight in how they can attack the mitochondria and chronic fatigue syndrome. We all love our brains. So this one is basically saying how acrotoxin A will affect your memory because the hippocampus is where we keep our memories. This is Schumacher's one review uh, where they did brain scans. So they did volumetric MRI studies and there are areas of the brain that shrink when you have mold illness um, because they do cross the blood brain barrier and there is this chronic inflammation that comes along with it. So the amygdala for brain. So definitely our brains get affected and Dale Bredesen, I think you all know who he is. If you don't, he's the Alzheimer's guy in a good way, not a bad way. Uh, and here we have type three Alzheimer's disease is the result of exposure to specific toxins. Got to protect our brains. Here we have acrotoxin A and it's linked to Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. Cancer, I think a lot of them are carcinogenic, so I'll go more, more into those as they come along. Psychiatric conditions, uh, including suicide. I mean, people get so sick, they just don't want to live anymore. And then, because uric acid is a toxic metabolite of yeast and fungus, things like gout. I just thought I'd add that in there for you. 
So molds need moisture, they need their spores, they need oxygen, they need a nice dark place full of food and at the right temperature for them. I say that because some of them like it cool, some of them like it warm, some of them like both. We can categorize them in hazard class. So there's A, which is producing mycotoxins. There's, there's B, which is allergenic, and there's C, which is the pathogenic. Those are the ones that are opportunistic and will, if, you have, if your immune system is suppressed, they can kill you. So these are the numbers of the pages, just in case you do want to use this as a reference. I'm going to go through each one of these. I try to get a really accurate picture of each one of them as well. But the thing about mold is that although it might look like that one day, uh, they don't always look, I mean, they can look very different, like dark green or brown hairs in this case. So this is Alternaria. It is extremely allergenic and it affects children specifically. So asthmatic children, you want to know if they've got exposure to this particular one here. And dry, windy weather tends to make them worse because it's spreading the spores. Remember allergies, you're, re you're reacting to the spores. We're not talking mycotoxins unless they're a hazard class B. So they can be found inside the house, on carpets, uh, window frames and air conditioners, showers and bathtubs. You'll probably find that most of the slides say that they're around showers and bathtubs because that's just where moisture is, I guess. Um, they do grow outdoors as well. A lot of the, the, the molds grow outdoors in rotting leaves and soil. So I have put all the different sources here and uh, the best test in this case, because it's an allergenic one, the best test is to do the, the expanded mold panel so you can see current, past, and allergic reactions. Aspergillus, this is a massive species, 200 recognized species. Okay, can look like that. This, that it's not the, the black mold that you're thinking of, that's a different one. Uh, and it's has a class A, B, and C. So I thought I'd bring up the mummy's curse. I don't know if you know, but when uh, the, the tombs got opened up and mummies were first found, most of the archeologists died. Uh, and it was found that they had lung infections with this aspergillus. We killed them a few months later, it didn't kill them on the day. So it got called the mummy's curse um, because it does. It, it, uh, it's not only produces toxins and there are more toxins here than, it, than I've written um, but it also, they feed on uh, insects and humans as well. So they are pretty intense um, and they grow on just about anything. So you can read that in your own time. This is so pretty, Oreo basidium. I uh, thought that was a really pretty mold. <laughs> There's only 15 recognized species of this one. Uh, it's a class B allergenic mold. So again, you're going to be looking at the expanded mold panel. Uh, it's on wet wood window frames, of course. Uh, it occurs in meat stores as it can grow at very low temperatures. So if you're seeing this as a result, uh, just make sure that you're creating a, a meal plan that maybe doesn't include meat that's been in a cold store. Uh, also seeds, barley, oats, tomatoes, berries, citrus fruits, grapes, and pecans. So what I mean by that is if you're creating like a, a specific for that patient food plan, you can have a look at what are they reacting to, what are the most common food sources, and you can create a plan around them by looking at this guide. I think everybody knows about Candida albicans. But in this case, it is class A, B, and C. It produces a toxin called gliotoxin. Uh, and it's, it can be deadly. Um, it's, it's, not a, it's not a disease we should ignore um, because it is one of the cause of mortality uh, in hospitalized adults. We all know that you need to kind of be immune suppressed for it. So that doesn't mean that if you're not immune suppressed, you won't get it. Uh, it does still grow in the, the gut of people who have other molds. Okay, so 
it's, remember it's opportunistic. So if you're exposed to a mold that's changing your microbiome to be more favorable to candida, it'll start to overgrow. So you will find it in the guts of people who have other mold exposures as well. It can be found anywhere. And I've added a couple of other tests here for people who are interested. Uh, we do a blood spot IgG, IgE, IgM test for if you're just looking for candida. Um, there is an, another immunocandida. This is a blood draw which looks at immunodiffusion, ELISA testing along with IgG. Uh, you can find it in the expanded mold panel though. Um, you will find it in stool tests if it is growing in there. Uh, you can also, like I mentioned, uh, look at the oats test. There are specific markers related to candida in the organic acid test. So do you have to do them all? No, you don't. You can if you need to, but um, you, can, you can start on one, uh, maybe a stool test. If they're not getting better with your program, you might want to look deeper at the expanded mole panel. Maybe they've got other things you need to be aware of. Ah, ketomium. This is common in water damaged buildings. Uh, it's got a very strong smell. It is a class A um, because it's got that smell. So it's probably got those uh, MVOCs and it does produce two specific mycotoxins. I'll be talking about the mycotoxins on their own a little bit later. Okay, indoors it's found on wallpaper, in walls themselves, depends on what your walls are made out of. In new builds in the UK, you can find it in the drywall. So we've got a lot of that here. Um, also in America, so this one here, be aware of the fact that it is also commonly found around Stachybotrys, which is the black mold that we fear so much. It's the one that if you see it growing in your, in your uh, bathroom, um, you should call someone to get rid of it. Okay, so you can test for this one using the expanded mold panel and the mycotox because there are specific toxins related to it. Cladosporium, this is a class B and um, they do produce volatile uh, organic compounds as well. So it's allergenic. This one doesn't get put into a category A, although it probably should be. It is a major source of inhalant allergens. So if, you, if you're finding that you're uh, not, so maybe, maybe you think that it's pollen that's creating your allergies. If it's not the pollen, be, be aware of the fact that this particular mold, if it's in your house, will make you feel like you're having hay fever the same as if it was pollen. So you'd find it in the expanded mold panel. This is Epicosum purpurescens a hazard class B, so it's allergenic, and again you'll find it in the expanded mold panel. This one's also really pretty. I do like purple. So Fusarium, uh, it is about 70 species. It spreads extremely quickly, so if you find it, you're going to have to check all the rooms in the house. And it is uh, A and B, so it's both toxic and allergenic. It produces the tricothecenes, it produces zeranolone, which is highly estrogenic, and citronine, which is extremely toxic, even at small doses. We'll go through each one of those in a moment. Um, here, if you do find it, people should be off rice, cane, sugar, soybeans, maize, asparagus. Okay, so in some of the mold diets that I found, they, would, they said you can eat asparagus, but if asparagus is your source, um, either wash it very carefully with things that would kill or get rid of uh, the, mic the mold itself. Um, the chances are you should just avoid those things while you're getting better. So expanded mold panel, mycotox, oat, and I've added the Dutch here purely because of the highly estrogenic activity of xeranolin. Mucor, it's an allergenic mold. And it can be found in pineapple, fruit juice, marmalade, certain soft cheeses. It's also found in leathers, meat, dairy products, uh, animal hair, and burlap and hessian. Uh, so if you have a lot of that lying around in a damp environment, you're just inviting mucor into your house. And if you're interested, you'll find it in the expanded mold panel. 
This is penicillium. There are about 200 species. They have a musty odor and a rapid growth rate. They're A and B. They also have the microbial volatile compounds that, that um, can affect you even if you don't have the mycotoxins. All the ones that I've listed in red and are um, bold, that you will find those in the mycotoxin. So there's ocotoxin, mycophenolic acid, citronine, and stereomatocytin. <laughs> uh, just a note that if you're allergic or sensitive to this particular mold, it doesn't mean, it doesn't relate to a sensitivity to the antibiotic penicillin. They're quite different. So like most molds, you'll find them in water-damaged buildings. Uh, unfortunately, you'll find them on things like cheese, fruits, spices, and cereals. Uh, they grow behind paint, unfortunately, and penicillin loves, loves dust. So uh, be aware of the fact that you live in a dusty area or if you have a dusty house and you have penicillin, you're going to be breathing it in a lot more. Um, citrus fruits, jams, breads, apples, nuts, <laughs> stuffed rubber mattresses, uh, furniture, leather, so literally anything, anywhere, anyhow. Mycotox in the expanded mold panel is where you'll find that. This is the only picture I could find of FOMO because it attacks leaves. So that's a leaf that you're looking at there. Uh, they're found in soil. They attack plants. Uh, they're a hazard class A and B. They produce the citronin mycotoxin as well as allergy. So you'll find them in both the expanded mold panel and the mycotox. Okay, this is bread mold. It's allergenic. I'm going to go a little bit faster so I can get to the mycotoxins. You'll find it in the expanded mold panel. Uh, Cetomelanoma rostrata is allergenic. You'll find it in the expanded mold panel. This is black mold. This is the one that is definitely related to illnesses. Uh, unlike some of the ones where people am and are about them, this one is has a class A tax toxic mold. It produces Roradin E and Virus Karen A. They're both triclothecenes. Triclothecenes are some of the worst mycotoxins you can get. Uh, if you find this in your house, I joke to say just burn your house down and walk away, but <laughs> uh, if you can't do that, this is one way I wouldn't personally go and clean it myself. I would get a professional to come in and get rid of it for me. Stemphilium herbarum, this is an allergenic mold. So you'll find it in the expanded mold panel. Uh, it gets worse when there's humidity. Trichoderma, this is an allergenic mold. Uh, it's really dangerous for your environment. So you need to get this one professionally looked at by, uh, by a professional building mold person because it'll damage the, the whole environment, not just you. Okay, so let's get into the mycotoxins. As I've mentioned, these are toxic substances produced by molds. They're really tiny, just for reference. Uh, a mold spore is one to 20 microns and the mycotoxin is 0 0.1 generally. So they can get through things that you wouldn't think they could get through. Uh, they grow with the molds on anything and everything, as you can see from the previous slides. And they're definitely released more when the organism is under stress, which is why it's so important to have a professional clean the environment, because just by cleaning the environment, you can make yourself sick. So we're going to go through these 11 toxins very quickly. Aflatoxin. Uh, when you're using this as your reference, just come back and see where you can find it. This particular toxin can cause liver damage, cancer, mental impairments. It does all sorts of horrible things, hepatotoxicity, mutagenic edema, digestion issues, even death. Uh, it is particularly bad if it's found along with ocrotoxin and zeranolone. At the bottom here, I've, I've added the binders that have been shown to work for the particular toxin that I'm talking about. So aflatoxin, bentonite, charcoal, and chlorella. Uh, so you don't necessarily have to use uh, a prescribed medication. Here we can see aflatoxin binding to DNA and creating these depurinated DNAs. Uh, this is exactly how 4-hydroxyestrone can damage our DNA. So it does exactly the same thing. It creates these adducts 
and they can be picked up in the urine. This is 12 weeks of 100 milligrams of chlorophyll, and you can see that there's been a reduction of the placebo group, no change, and the chlorophyll group has had a reduction in the adduct. So chlorophyll is effective. Um, it's also been linked to hepatic cancer, and it's 60 times worse in people who've had concomitant hepatitis B. Uh, so just something to remember. Citronine, uh, it's one of the trichothecenes, very, very dangerous mycotoxin. Uh, it affects the mitochondrial membranes of the kidneys. Uh, it's carcinogenic. It affects the immune system. And the treatment for this particular one is a blend of binders. Here's a little cheat sheet for you. Keto Globusin A. This is found in water damaged homes and it's extremely toxic at minimal doses. It affects cellular division and movement. So again, it's affecting DNA and our protein synthesis. It's been linked to neuronal damage, peritonitis, cutaneous lesions. And again, there are numerous binders that will help. So you can use them all. Just a few notes, it has similar effects to xeranolone. It can damage the spleen and the thymus. It damages spermatocytes. So if you're uh, experiencing male infertility, it might be because they've got a mycotoxin in them. And there's often respiratory distress. Eniatin B comes from Fusarium. Uh, here, bentonite and S. Bilardi. So a lot of people don't realize that Saccharomyces boulardii can be very effective at binding. And in this particular one, you'll see weight loss. Uh, it, it, unlike some of the, the molds that create weight gain, Eniatin B causes significant weight loss. So gliotoxin is the one I mentioned by Candida. It's also produced by Aspergillus. It basically wrecks the white blood cells and T cells. So it's, it's uh, immune system annihilating. Uh, your treatment there, bentonite, NAC, N-acetylcysteine, and s -bilardi. Mycophenolinic acid uh, can increase the risk of opportunistic infections such as clostridia and candida. This is what I was mentioning earlier. You know, just because candida is there, don't think that it's there on its own. Uh, it is also used as an immunosuppressant drug. So please let the lab know if your client is on either of these two medications. And because it's found in blue cheese, tell them to stop eating blue cheese for about a week before. Uh, and there's no specific binder. Acrotoxin A, it's a trichothecene. It's nephrotoxic, neurotoxic, immunotoxic, carcinogenic, uh, basically everything. Uh, again, uh, dopamine levels of the brain have been affected. So this is the one linked to Parkinson's disease as per the research I showed you earlier. In this case, cholesteramine, which is the prescription medication that people hear about with binders, is indicated, but so are charcoal binders. So if you don't have access to the one, you still have access to the other. Roridin E, this is also a trichothecene. Uh, it is found in water damaged buildings again. Uh, it's, it's, I'm actually gonna show you the next page just to show you all the things that are related to these, this, these particular trichothecenes. But here are your treatments, bentonite, charcoal, and chlorella. Trichothecenes used in biological war warfare inhibit mitochondrial function, bone marrow suppression, nervous system, GI distress, increase apoptosis, bad stuff. This slide is repeated later, so I'll skip over it. Steric matocystin, uh, it's found in dust and affects the liver, kidneys, and immune system. Uh, it is a big depleter of antioxidants such as glutathione. So if you do see stereomatocystin, you use your nonspecific binders as well as glutathione because that will be depleted. And varicarin A, it's another trichothecene, inhibits protein and DNA synthesis, disrupts mitochondrial function, causes oxidative stress, uh, causes immunological problems, vomiting, Bad stuff. This is the repeated slide, so I'll skip over that. Xeranolone, I think I've mentioned this a few times, so you know now that it's estrogenic, but it's also hepatotoxic, hemotoxic, immunotoxic, and genotoxic. It is extremely potent as an endocrine disruptor. Uh, it is 
way more potent than the non-steroidal isoflavin compounds that we, we, see, we use in practice. And it can impair infertility and it's transgenerational. Don't ask me how, um, but I did find this and I was amazed. So treatment is bentonite and espalade. This is just a little cheat slide for you. And then this is a, a great site, mycotoxin.info. If you wanna go deep into each one of them, you can spend hours or days or weeks on this site. So mycotoxins.info. Just a quick summary of what they do. They affect our DNA, they alter protein synthesis, there's definitely oxidative stress, they deplete antioxidants, alter cell membrane function, potent mitochondrial toxins, and they alter apoptosis. Here are the main ones and their primary mechanism of action. And a list of short and long-term effects. So they go from the sublime, feeling ill, slightly ill, to death. So let's get into treatment so I don't go too much over time. Killing mold, treat the environment. You can't kill mold without killing it in the environment. Uh, bleach is effective, as is benzoyl ammonium chloride, or you can call a professional and they'll do it for you. You need to improve the air quality, so improve ventilation, get an air purifier. How do you kill mycotoxins? Well, pretty much you don't. <laughs> you break them down if you can. Uh, fire at 500 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 260 degrees Celsius for half an hour, uh, or 900 degrees, which is 482 degrees Celsius for 10 minutes. That's for trichothecene mycotoxins. They literally have no desire to be eradicated. <clears throat> you can use ozone, but if you're using ozone, keep everybody out of the house because they will die at the, the levels needed to, to kill off what you need to kill. Uh, Unfortunately, ultraviolet light and freezing doesn't really seem to have that much of an effect on mycotoxins. I remember you could kill a mold, but the mycotoxin's still there. HEPA, HEPA air filters are not really that effective at removing mycotoxins. They can remove the, the spores. If you wanna get rid of the mycotoxins, it's an activated carbon filter that you need. Um, good news is that they do eventually break down. It could take them 10 years, but it, <laughs> eventually they will break down. When it comes to people, every person with a mold mycotoxin issue is genetically and biochemically unique. I don't believe in protocols. A lot of my practitioners get annoyed with me when they say, what's your protocol for X? And I'm like, well, I don't have one. I have people who I need to assess and then each person gets their own bespoke protocol. <laughs> it isn't just a one size fits all. In my experience, it is better to test in some cases, uh, not all of the tests. Uh, you can do all of them if you want to, but do one of them and find out, uh, do they have the mycotoxins? Do they have that immunological action? Is there growth? And then if you need to, there are tests that you can do uh, the DNA for uh, their predispositions for detox, inflammation and oxidative stress, the Dutch stool testing and metabolomics. And we are all around to support you. So if you're not, if you've gone through this whirlwind of, of slides and you're thinking, oh, I don't know what to do, you are still welcome to call us. And remember, you do get these slides and the slides don't talk as fast as I do. So, so step one, remove the source. And there are some fantastic aromatherapy oils. There's sage, tea tree, uh, uh, lots of them. So you can do an aromatherapy oil blend, you can make your house smell nice. Um, if you have a dehumidifier, remember that they can be a source of mold as well. So be careful with that. You need to get your ERMI score below two. That's a professional company that'll come in and do that. There is uh, some dietary things. Okay, we'll talk about coffee for a second. Um, yes, coffee is known for mycotoxins, but not all brands of coffee have mycotoxins in them, and it's not the ones that only claim to be mycotoxin-free that don't have mycotoxins, if that makes sense. So there are some brands out there that will guarantee you that they don't have mycotoxins in them. Um, but if you randomly test a whole bunch of them, it's, it's not often that coffee in the, in the EU, for example, will have mycotoxins. It could be different in the United States. Um, definitely, Avoid some fermented foods, but kefir has a specific lactobacillus that seems to help. 
avoid alcoholic beverages and grains in general. Um, and I've added their leftovers because leftovers get exposed to the environment and then you eat them a few days later. This is a long list, but essentially the list is paleo, keto, um, and it's very generalized. Um, what I would say is have a look at any of the specific things on this list and compare it to the things that you found in your results. Um, if, some, if something is on here like uh, Jack Asparagus and they've got CRN alone, take it off the list for them. Got to remember to stay hydrated. You're going to get, you've got to flush those mycotoxins out of your liver and your kidneys. Let's talk a little bit about binders. There is this cholesteramine. So if you're a prescriber, you can most definitely give it. It doesn't work for everybody. It can make some people worse because it's, uh, it's extremely strong. I've seen people take a dose of cholesteramine and, and just have huge exaggerations to their symptoms. If that happens, there's this well cull. Uh, which is much gentler. They both work on their cholesterol lowering medications. So they work on binding uh, to the, the toxins. If you are not interested in the compounded and pharmaceutical stuff, I personally use Ultra Binder by Quicksilver. It's got clay, charcoal, and a whole bunch of things in it. Uh, if I need to, there's Espelade, there's Chlorella, there's also N acetylcysteine. Um, so they are the, the specific binders for the specific toxins. If you're wanting to know more, I've given you an example, a cheat sheet of the main toxic uh, mycotoxins and the things that help with them. Gluc glucomannan, I, I don't use as a supplement. I tend to give that as a food. So it's not added as a supplement, but it is there. Always optimize detoxification and gut health. I personally own an infrared sauna and it does work this for me. Um, I've listed a bunch of supplements that can help DIM, obviously for the estrogenic one. Uh, if you're not aware of how nucleotides can affect the liver uh, regeneration with mycotoxins, we uh, do have interviews with Dr. Peter Kuppel in our YouTube channel on nucleotides where I spoke to him about mycotoxins and nucleotides. So definitely, definitely something you want to be giving to people. And then this Lactobacillus brevis, there's some uh, evidence that it is a, is a probiotic, which is found in Vital 10, uh, is effective at healing the gut with mold and mycotoxic issues. If they're very allergic, you want to address their allergic response because they're going to be uncomfortable, uncom bleh, uncomfortable. And if they've got mitochondrial issues, you need to give them the things that will support the mitochondria, things like CoQ10 and these factors. In some cases, they might need antifungals. Uh, itraconazole seems to be the best if you can prescribe, um, but there are a few not prescription uh, fungals as well. I can, I can hear somebody. You can look for the sensitivity of things like candida in a stool analysis and you can target specifically if you want to. And then you also need to prevent reinfection. So control humidity, get ventilation, get rid of damp, use an air purifier, get a mold inspector. Um, damp proofing is extremely uh, important. You need to remediate your house, but it is expensive. You might actually want to choose to move, um, but that's up to you. And you might move into another moldy house, so always consider that. I'm not going to read through these slides, but essentially the things that determine how long it'll take you to recover are number one, your exposure time. The longer you're exposed, the longer it takes to get better. Number two, the type of mold. If it's the 10% of the seriously poisonous molds, you're going to take longer. And if you have a mold sensitivity, you will take longer. Uh, so in conclusion, mold allergies and illnesses are not the same thing. They are common. They're extremely serious. They can affect anyone. Doesn't matter if you're HLA sensitive. You need to assess the environment, test, don't guess. Those are the three tests that I recommend. Uh, and treat according to the patient's individual needs. Don't get bogged down on any one type of protocol because everyone's different. I have added a list of resources that I found quite useful. It's not an exhaustive list, um, but you're welcome to spend some time doing your own homework. Uh, the book Toxic, Heal Your Body from Mold Toxicity Lyme Disease by Dr. Neil Nathan is an excellent book. 
and I put the end of Alzheimer's by Dale Bredesen there for you as well. And I don't know if we have time for Q&A because I feel like I've been talking for way longer than an hour. <laughs> I think we do have some time. People are still here. <laughs> on. We've got 210 people listening to you, Samaya. So well done. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I've been writing down a little bit here because there have been a lot of questions on the side. Okay. So and yes, you are really... Uh, pl plethora of information in regards to mycotoxins and I think for sure you have been an inspiration to everybody listening how to do more research read more and so on and of course we will share the recording and your slides and everything so uh, look out for the mail so um, quite a few questions came came up in regards to binders um, first of all um, Let's just discuss the mechanism of action in regards to the binders, because in regards to toxicity, you have the interhepatic um, pathway that allows for the uh, toxicity from the moles to keep, it just keeps re-entering into the body unless you have the binders in the gut that can bind the bile so you can excrete it through your uh, intestines. Do you have any comments to that, Shania? Um think of it more as like an electrostatic charge so they bind specifically to certain things and move them out of the body um i i, I can't really comment more because it's exactly that it's preventing them from they've already gone through the liver once you don't want them to go through the liver again and do the damage again and possibly again and again and again so the binders are specific for mycotoxins uh they they do bind to other things as well so you kind of have to take them away from other supplements and food you can take them all at once uh, at the end of the day some you can take with your other supplements like uh, espalardi and nac and even chlorella but if you're using the activated charcoal or the clays or cholesteramine it has to be away from foods and yeah they they are effective um they, they can trigger a, a kind of like a weird detox reaction in sensitive people. So you have to dose according to the person. In, in really sensitive people, that, when I say sensitive, they will vomit at the smell of someone's perfume. Okay, so they're like super ill, super sensitive. You need to start on a minuscule dose and slowly build up to a point where you know that they're, they're detoxing, but they're tolerating as well. Thank you. I think that was important to to uh, understand that for, because everybody else, everybody tomorrow is going to look out for all these mold and toxicity <laughs> patients and then what to do next. So thank you for that. Um, another thing that came up that made me think a little bit further, um, because many of you probably do like food, IgG, food intolerance tests and often you see like a cluster that there's a positive reaction to mushrooms. Uh, yeast both bakers and brewers yeast and would that be a clue to look yeah. out for these yeah so food sensitivities are definitely increased with mycotoxicity and mold uh, allergies because the leaky gut will happen but also there will be remnants of whatever mold or mycotoxin there is in you so if it is a yeast based one most definitely you'll start reacting to other yeasts with an IgG reaction we go. The food sensitivities are on the list. If you read my checklist, <laughs> food sensitivities are on the list. <laughs> Excellent. I think we have uh, passed the time. Um, and uh, oh, yeah, just one. That's actually a, a good question. Now, now, lots of questions are coming in, but in <laughs> regards to pregnancy um, and, and, and detoxification during pregnancy, if you have someone who, because you, you were mentioning how you, you could find it in the breast milk and so on, then. I, I, with any question when it comes to pregnancy and detoxification, it doesn't matter whether it's mycotoxicity or metal toxicity or some other type of toxicity, you do it before the pregnancy starts. Unfortunately, that baby is a detoxifying agent for the mother will suck in a lot of the stuff that is toxic in the mother. So if a woman is heavy metal toxic and she falls pregnant, that baby 
we'll take heavy metals because it mom's not supposed to be full of rubbish right she's supposed to be full of good nutrients and good building blocks so the baby will take all this stuff and mold will go mycotoxins will go breast will be, yep fix the problem before the pregnancy unfortunately there's nothing you can do during a pregnancy because you could make it worse and you could create a miscarriage i wouldn't do anything so rather leave it there and um yeah just work on the healthy pregnancy a few questions has come up in regards to toxic prevent oh uh, yeah yeah, yeah. toxic prevent is a binder and that's so it, it. It's a clay binder. So if you see clay binder, <laughs> Toxic Prevent is a binder. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Shania, you, it was a pleasure listening to you and thank you for sharing from your heart um, and your own experience. And again, Shania is part of the Nordic DNA Life family. And I just really want you all practitioners out there to get to know us as much as possible so that yeah we, we feel that we are united and so on thank you everybody again we will send out the recordings and the slides and if there's some links that uh, we thought were more relevant than others we might put that in as well and then again we will have a little break because uh, it's summertime and I'm going camping <laughs> and then I think uh, we will do a, a webinar I think right now it's planned for the 13th of August, but it may change. Um, so, and this has been a great success with these webinars. So, of course, we will continue and we will continue sharing education um, throughout uh, the next period of time as well. But it's a little bit of summer break here. Sorry for South Africa because it's kind of winter there. But uh, <laughs> anyway, I love you all. Virtual hug to everybody and um, please be in touch with us if you have questions reach out to the mails that we are sending you can reply to those and um, yeah we are here to help and support you as much as we can take care bye yeah. now i can't find the button to yeah no i can <laughs> end the meeting fold bye, bye. <laughs>